Hello and welcome to another one of my videos. I am Alex and I am the Wandering Englishman. Although today you find me cycling while wandering about life. Coming up in today's video, I'm going to talk about the virus, the media, London, and also ponder a few things impacting myself and probably yourself also. As our tyrannical masters have banned all travel from the UK and most of the planet, I wanted to sit down with a microphone, meaning you, and talk to my wonderful subscribers, and of course some people who have not yet subscribed. This is a journey that I do frequently these days, as I find my time being spent between Shoreditch and Clapham in these bleak lockdown days. The reason it's so grey, well this is London in January. I know a lot of my subscribers are not from England, and some of you have not had the good fortune of visiting before, so I know you have preconceptions on what London and England is like. Well, I can assure you London can be wonderfully sunny with amazing blue skies some of the time. However, if you take in the sights and sounds of London in January, the chances are you're going to be exposed to weather just like this. And yet, despite being on the same latitude as Moscow, the winters in London are considerably milder than Moscow. Although this does come at a price. An Englishman will need an umbrella more than a Russian will need one in Moscow. If you haven't subscribed to this channel, do click the subscribe button, it really helps me out. It costs you nothing to be a subscriber and the hope is it incentivizes YouTube and the other platforms that I am on to possibly show my videos to people just like you. If you're a fan of free speech, I do suggest following me on Library, aka Odyssey, as so far the platform sides with those that support free speech, whereas the big tech giants such as YouTube believe in the falsehoods of things like hate speech and censorship, 1984 style. Gone are the days where YouTube cheered on free speech. Remember Google's old motto, don't be evil. Well, they no longer have that as their motto and they certainly don't live by that motto. Like I say, this is a journey I take frequently. Today I'm cycling from South London to North London in the most direct line possible. Not the prettiest of roads, but you will see what lockdown is like during lockdown 3.0. I will say compared to late March, April 2020, when the UK was in full lockdown, the roads today are much more busy. What was strange about the time back then, the roads were eerily empty. For example, this road I'm cycling on, you could walk safely across blindfolded and not hear a car for several minutes. Now, despite us being in the same sort of lockdown, the roads are very busy. Just an educated estimate, that I deduce from my own observations, I think traffic is 80% of what it was pre-COVID. Whereas in March, April 2020, the traffic was probably 10% of what it was pre-COVID. Well, what does this mean? Well, it tells me and you also that people need to work and people have stopped living in the fear that washed over them back in March 2020. And thank God for that. Now I've spoken in length on my blog and in various YouTube videos about my changing belief as the facts become more and more clear that I think this is far more sinister than the majority even seem to be awake to. My original thoughts on this matter date back to Christmas 2019 and January 2020 on Facebook. Now some of these posts have now been deleted by the Facebook gods. They don't advocate spreading false information they claim. Well, things have certainly changed since then. It would seem the Facebook censors seem to know more about the virus than those scientists that dare dissent. In early March 2020, I wrote a blog post titled, Was the COVID virus released upon the world by a shadow organization? And at the same time, I released a YouTube video, Should We Worry About COVID-19? I pondered the changes that began to take place. After those posts, the West weeks later locked down. Although the UK left its borders wide open, and I believe they did that on purpose. They sent the elderly and the vulnerable population home from the hospitals where they had been receiving the care from. This deliberate act was responsible for the countless numbers of early deaths, which is why we saw a spike in the deaths in April 2020. Of course, these deaths were blamed on COVID-19 rather than the real reason, which was the deliberate negligence by our leaders and healthcare provider managers. Not only did our leaders neglect the most vulnerable of society by denying from them the needed care that in a normal year would have been given to them, our leaders 
left the country exposed and open by importing the virus due to selfishly welcoming visitors from COVID-19 hotspots. I personally traveled in and out of the UK multiple times and not once was I tested or even stopped to have my temperature measured. And yet when I arrived in Italy, back in March 2020, they measured my temperature as a precaution. Now throughout 2020, the EU leaders allowed the mass importation of illegal migrants to travel freely into Europe, crossing multiple borders, enabling the spread of people who were intent to ignore the legal routes, but also to spread lethal and non-lethal viruses to the population they would inevitably come in contact with. Now, you would almost think it was intentional by most global leaders to allow the spread of the virus so that once it spread, they could impose authoritarian measures onto the population. Authoritarian measures that could be increased as the spread of the so-called virus spreads. However, by April 2020, I had changed my mind on the severity of the virus and why it was released. I speculated in my blog post and video titled, I may have been wrong about COVID-19 that it may have been weaponized deliberately to bring down populations, but the virus had been proven ineffective to the depopulation needs. However, as the plan had been put in motion, global governments had committed to their masters and thus acted to impose more strangulating laws on the populace and prepared themselves to bring in the Great Reset. By July 2020, it was clear that governments were committed to ruining small businesses and that populations were pushovers when it came to submitting to their governments. People were very accepting to every incremental rule brought in by their leaders. In the UK, for example, restaurants and pubs were finally given permission to open up again, having been closed since March 2020. However, it came with authoritarian guidelines. I wrote about these measures in my blog post, The Chai Coms Have Ruined British Pubs. New measures are tracking and tracing and the insistence of compulsory wearing of a nappy on one's face were reminding the population that lockdown too would come for them and that they must not get too comfortable. In my mind, the population were being prepped for what was to come as well as tested to see how subservient the population were to the ever increasing authoritarian Big Brother measures. Now, despite over 70% of the population supporting further lockdown measures, some brave souls decided to fight back. Protests erupted around the globe now, as I've spent the majority of my time in London in 2020, and also in the first month of 2021, I'll keep focusing on what's been happening here. I personally witnessed multiple protests on the streets of London where people spoke up against the lockdowns and what they thought were disproportionate measures against a virus that seemed to be no lethal than a bad flu year. To back this up, it was revealed that the majority of COVID-19 deaths were overinflated and that 98% of all deaths had underlying health conditions. Translation, imagine a country has 100,000 deaths recorded because of COVID-19. I think if you can safely say the figure is 2% of this figure, 2,000 deaths because of COVID-19. Of course, 2,000 deaths is 2,000 too many, but is it any reason to shut down the world and deny patients with other conditions treatment because there is a COVID emergency? Yet, in 2020, when Black Lives Matter protesters were able to rampage and cause millions of pounds worth of damage all over the UK, and the world for that matter, but let's focus on the UK, the British police stood back and allowed it all to happen, often being chased down the road by protesters, as shown in one of my videos, Antifa and Black Lives Matter desecrate British monuments in London, and also another video, Thugs clash at Black Lives Matter protests in London, the Met Police finally protect statues. And yet when protesters who showed no signs of damaging buildings wanted to gather and voice their concerns over lockdowns, mandatory vaccines and sinister motives, police all over the world went extremely authoritarian on all of those speaking out. I covered the protests in one of my videos titled The Anti-Plandemic Protest those who were smeared by the MSM for having a different view to them. And also in my video, the Unite for Freedom video, titled Anti-Lockdown Protest, the police crush all those who dare speak out against the tyranny. It was by August 2020 that I concluded this had all been one big psyop, 
with my post, your leaders destroyed the economy on purpose. By October 2020, I'd found myself fleeing the country to get away from the authoritarian measures the British public had submitted to. I had a birthday to celebrate and I would be damned if a government was going to tell me that I had to stop drinking by 10pm. I headed to Poland for a long weekend and just as I was leaving the country, I was informed by the newswires that anyone travelling back from Poland after Friday would have to quarantine upon their return for two weeks. Thankfully, I work from home much of these days, so that wasn't really going to be a problem. However, it was going to prove to be a completely pointless exercise. What right does a government have to make you a prisoner in your own home? I pondered the measures while I waited for my plane at Gatwick Airport. The video is titled, Your Leaders Destroy the Economy, Not the Virus. Airports have been decimated by our leaders. Upon returning from Poland and completing my so-called quarantine, the British public got closer and closer to lockdown too. By mid-October, I wrote about how the world governments were easing us in to authoritarian lockdown. And as predicted, as it was all previously planned way back in 2019, we entered lockdown too, at least in the UK. On November 5th, 2020, our supreme leaders informed us that it would only last four weeks and yet with a furlough scheme that only props up middle income earners and completely ignores those who work for themselves, we could see it was being extended until March 2021. If the lockdown was going to last four weeks, then what would be the need for furlough to last until March 2021? Well, elementary, my dear Watson, your supreme leaders lied to you once again. We now find ourselves in the first quarter of 2021, and as predicted, this is shaping up to be cold and dark for many in the Northern Hemisphere. Our leaders will tease us with the promises that all will be well soon. I've said this for over a year and been called a nutty conspiracy theorist. The end game is the Chi-Com social credit system, and this will be introduced with health passports. So far, our leaders are claiming the vaccine isn't mandatory, but as repeated over and over again since the start of 2020, our leaders will make your life impossible if you refuse to get the vaccine. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but I can bet you by the end of 2021, life is going to get very difficult if you refuse that vaccine. Vaccine companies are falsely claiming that the vaccine has a 95% success rate. You have a 99.99% chance of survival from this virus. So why would you take your chances with a vaccine that has a worse success rate than the human body has at fighting this so-called virus? Especially when we know statistically from other vaccines the side effects can affect between 1 in 10 in every 100 people being immunized, depending on the vaccine. We also won't know the fallout, aka the side effects, from the vaccine for at least another 10 years. On what planet would you be persuaded to take this vaccine other than at gunpoint? Of course, by me saying this, this video is now going to get demonetized, but I do need to say these things. Only time will tell if the future turns out to be more authoritarian and bleak, but the signs do not look good. Those who lurk in the shadows controlling our leaders seem very confident right now that they have their ship on course. Will they hit an iceberg? I can only hope so. I wrote a blog post at the end of 2020 titled, Do you remember the scene taken from where the girls are forced to inject? Now, one of Liam Neeson's defining roles was from the low-budget film that grossed over $226 million at the global box office. To this day, Taken continues to make the filmmaker's money from its continued play on services such as Amazon and Netflix. Many scenes from that movie and the trilogy remain implanted in my memory, and I'm sure your memory too. From the most famous scene from where Brian Mills says, I will look for you. I will find you. Yet yeah, there's a scene that's been haunting me for months now. The scene is where scumbag men from all walks of life queue up outside the tents on a Parisian construction site, waiting their turn to spend their grimy euros. Now some are aware and some are simply not caring for the plight of the girls waiting to service them, while others, I'm sure, were simply oblivious to the fact that the girls were being forced to inject drugs without their consent.
And in Brian Mills' daughter's case, and many other girls like her, she was kidnapped from the place that she considered safe, tied up and forced with needles to inject a cocktail of drugs so she would be far easier to manage. Treatment, I'm sure 99.9999% of society would deem unacceptable. And yet, in 2021, I'm almost certain that these same people who would deem this unacceptable would look the other way if the government did the same to their neighbours. How do I know this? Well, in 2013, a YouGov study found that 55% of adults believe vaccines should be mandatory for something as simple as an MMR injection. Sadly, the British public, and I think also the global public, in 2021 are very similar when it comes to completely untested vaccines, the COVID-19 vaccine in particular. A recent study carried out by YouGov found that 49% of British adults believe the vaccine should be mandatory. And a further 17% were so brain dead when asked this question, they simply said, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? It's a simple yes or no question. And the answer to that question is, no, it should not be mandatory. This study gave the power and authority to the British government and most likely all Western governments set up and paid attention. It authorised, without much of a struggle, the ability to push forward with authoritarian powers that would make our leaders no better than the fictional people trafficking Albanians in the film Taken. The British government's health secretary, Matt Hancock, has already admitted that mandatory vaccines cannot be ruled out. This utter cretin of a health secretary seems inspired by the fictional Albanian drug gangs that Liam Neeson so beautifully took out over the course of his 2008 box office smash. This slimy individual who is jointly responsible for the destruction of the British economy in 2020 and 2021 will most likely claim that vaccines won't be mandatory, but at the same time he will be putting pressure on big business to make your life very difficult if you refuse to get that vaccine. Already we have companies like Qantas Airways come out and say they will not allow passengers to board their planes unless they are vaccinated. Since Qantas Airways have come forward, we've had companies like Pimlico Plumbers come forward and the head of Pimlico Plumbers have simply said, we will not hire individuals who have not taken the vaccine, which I think is beyond contemptuous. And I'm sure there will be many, many more globalists who will say exactly the same thing. And I urge people, pies should be waiting for them should they ever take this path. The Iraqi-born minister for Stratford-on-Avon, Nadim Zawawi, was recently given responsibility for the COVID-19 vaccine deployment at the DHSC, who, it must be added, also co-founded the international internet-based market research firm YouGov, of which he was the chief executive until February 2010. No conflicts of interest there at all, is there? Nadim Zawahi is thought to be the second highest paid MP sitting in British Parliament due to his numerous corporate connections. Isn't it amazing how the same market research company that he founded has been testing the waters for months when it comes to finding out how submissive the UK population is in regards to the mandatory vaccines? beyond corrupt and beyond sinister, if you were really to ask my take on this matter. YouGov were likely commissioned by the British government to measure how easy the British public would submit to the tyranny. And in doing so, Nadim Zawahi, the YouGov shareholder, indirectly benefited by getting the YouGov fees and fast-tracking the deployment of numerous COVID-19 vaccines the British government have purchased in recent months. At the end of 2020, the UK COVID vaccine minister suggested that bars, cinemas and football stadiums could ban Brits who hadn't had the jab. And he admits number 10 is looking into immunity passports. Now, if you're interested, I wrote a blog post back on this back in March 2020. And I told you that this would happen. And for that revelation, once again, I was labeled a conspiracy theorist. No government minister or government department should dictate what poison should go into one's body. Now this should not be done by any global government, multinational corporation or member of the public that demands mandatory vaccines on those that do not want them. Through either force, similar to the scene I'm taken, or via making dissenters lives impossible. Now if they do, in my opinion, 
they are no better than the fictional scumbag Albanians in the movies Taken 1, 2 and 3. And it is for this very reason I took myself onto the streets of London to march for my freedoms, along with many others. All I say is resist the tyranny at all costs. Please wake up. The time you have left as a free man or woman is quickly running out. The Great Reset will not be kind to the majority. The recovery from the pandemic is an opportunity. We can see rays of hope in the form of a vaccine, but there is no vaccine for the planet. Nature needs a bailout. You don't want to go back to the status quo that you had before simply because it was the status quo that got us here. With everything falling apart, we can reshape the world in ways we couldn't before. Ways that better address so many of the challenges we face. And that's why so many are calling for a great reset. Now is a historical moment, a time, not only to fight severe virus, but to shape the system. We have a unique but rapidly shrinking window of opportunity to learn lessons and reset ourselves on a more sustainable path. It is an opportunity we have never had before and may never have again. So we must use all the levers we have at our disposal, knowing that each and every one of us has a vital role to play. Now is the time to think what history would say about this crisis. And now is the time for all of us to define our own role. What is it that would make it so that history would look at this crisis as the great opportunity for reset. The Great Reset is a welcome recognition that this human tragedy must be a wake-up call. Well, as I continue my journey um, then through Bank and then on, on to my final destination, that is Shoreditch, you're probably wondering why is a traveller getting so wound up by all of these measures, such as lockdowns? Well, it's for precisely that reason. Before, I was free to travel and go places. The economy was ticking over and I didn't see desperation everywhere I went. The mood in London, the UK and much of the world, I think, strikes me as very bleak right now. Yes, some people are doing exceptionally well. Interior designers, landscapers, plumbers and, of course, the banksters. The richest 1% have seen their wealth skyrocket. We have seen the biggest transfer of wealth in human history in the last 12 months. I personally think historians will look back on these days as criminal. Ah, Alex, you will say, the lockdowns are to prevent further deaths and look how in 2020 we had all of these excess deaths. Well, I've looked into that and not really. I'm going to use the UK as an example once again. And you can pretty much use this for most countries, and I would like you to look at the data if you can. Now, while in 2020 we did experience the most deaths in all its history, but of course you would expect this over time with a growing population. Ah, you will say, but it's well above the five-year average, Alex. And that's exactly how you're being manipulated. Let's pull the data from the last 20 years. Look at the UK population from the year 2000 to the year 2020. Then let's look at the deaths of each year and then establish what percentage of the population died each year. Now if you look at 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003 and 2004, we will see them being almost identical to that of 2020, proving, at least for the UK, the number of deaths that happened in 2020 didn't make it an exceptional year. This despite the negligence from the hospitals, care homes and the increase in the number of suicides. And yet our leaders for this so-called The Great Reset, an idea from the World Economic Forum, decided to destroy the economy, livelihoods and hope for so many. Am I angry? Yes. Should I be angry? Yes, and you should be angry. Sweden didn't lock down, and its death rate is no different to that of any country in the EU. Lockdowns do not save lives, they simply destroy lives. Anyway, that is why I'm ranting. This has impacted my life just as much as it has impacted your life. Some, of course, think this is a walk in a park, but many do not. I really appreciate it that you got this far. If you did, leave a comment below, including the word Davos in your comment. It would be great to know if anyone was listening.
If you like this sort of content, it is a little bit different from my travel content, I have to admit. We will be traveling soon once the world wakes up to this criminal activity. We're now approaching pretty much what has been my local neighborhood for most of my London life. Uh, this is Finsbury Square. This Finsbury Square has got an amazingly nice hotel at the north side of the square, the one with the big tower that you see. This is a neighborhood that I've spent much of my life in. It has a lot of fond memories. I've seen some changes over the years. The number of buildings that have been demolished and rebuilt is I've lost count of number of bars that have come and gone, countless. Mostly the reasons they came and went because they just became stale. The pubs fortunately remain the same, most of them at least. Some pubs we lost to the demise of developers as they turned them into houses or apartments. But most stayed pretty much the same. The last 12 months have been completely unprecedented for this area. The city which we just cycled through has turned into a ghost town all of the shops are boarded up. There's the odd exception to that rule. There's the odd coffee shop still alive. There's the atrocious McDonald's still going and a couple of restaurants that are doing sort of delivery service. You'll still see open, but most of them have shut shop. I hope I'll be able to make a video about this soon. But if you walk down Fleet Street, which is between St. Paul's and the Strand, it used to be an incredibly wealthy area. So much to the point that the, one of the richest banks in the world is there, Goldman Sachs. But you wouldn't know it because of the lack of people in the financial district, in the city. Everything's shut. But anyway, going back to Shoreditch, Shoreditch is a very different place. Lots of artists. In a way, there's a lot of musicians that certainly flow into the area because there's a lot of places in normal times where you can go see a live band or, you know, you know go see a DJ, many of the clubs in the area. It's one of the reasons why I DJ'd for so many years, because Shoreditch was on my doorstep. Because Shoreditch was my doorstep, I was able to frequent the many establishments and get a reasonable number of gigs in this area. I had a few residencies. I'll be honest, it's a, um, it's a hobby slash occupation that I miss, but it was always a hobby and it certainly never really paid the bills. It certainly was fun. This entire journey with effectively heading north and I'm literally going to park my bike around the corner from my place. I probably shouldn't rant as much as I do about the whole COVID situation but it does wind me up. I do see these authoritarian hands taking a tighter grip on the planet and the majority of the population is just being super submissive. If you like this sort of content, I know I mentioned it at the start of the video and I've probably mentioned it somewhere else in the video. Do click that subscribe button. Also, leave me a comment. You might hate this. You might, in reality, if you hated this, you probably switched off after about five seconds. If you got this far, I really, really am thankful. And I am thankful for the um, persistent views that I get on a regular basis. I'm very grateful for that. And I, yeah, I want to say a big thank you. So in, hopefully I'll see you in the next video. And until next time, stay safe and uh, keep progressing. Well, that was uh, the video from Clapham until Old Street. Thanks for watching, I really appreciate it, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.